We all have an idea of the happiness that love will bring us. Most of us put the search for love at the very centre of our lives. And yet it's a subject on which philosophy is strangely silent. Given that few of our experiences feel more life-changing or more important, one might have thought that philosophers would take love very seriously. But on the whole, they haven't. They see it as a subject that's probably better left to poets, hysterics and chat show hosts on daytime TV. But there was one philosopher who did take love very seriously. He saw it as one of our central concerns. His name was Arthur Schopenhauer. In an admittedly rather unromantic field, Schopenhauer is the one philosopher who seems to understand the intensity of what we feel when we fall in love. He thought we were absolutely right to build our lives around love. Nothing else in life was quite as important. But the mistake he thought we made was to imagine that happiness had anything to do with it. Dear Michelle, I can't do this anymore. You know what you want and I know that I do not want to marry you. It's unfair on you and me to continue anymore. I'm so unhappy in the relationship, which I didn't, I didn't know that. I thought you was happy. Um, and it seems that however hard I try to look into the future positively, the situation does not feel right. By the time you read this, I'll have left for a month or two travelling. It's so hard, but I'm not the right one for you, nor you for me. That's terrible. So and then a PS, don't, please don't try and call, it's too upsetting. And I haven't seen or spoken to him since. So what was your first reaction when you, when you read this? I just passed into tears. What do you expect? I chuck myself in the loo and cried. You got a letter at Michelle work. Hutchison's boyfriend of four years yeah. left this letter, along with all her things from his flat, in a plastic bag at reception where she works. And did you try and call him? Did you, you, didn't, no. you didn't have any way of getting in touch with him? No, I did. I knew his numbers. But I didn't want to speak to him after that. I thought, this is it. I, I can't win my... I can't get myself out of this situation. I can't make him... Want me if that if that's so obviously clear that he doesn't want me. Tell me a bit more about him. I mean, what what's he like? What does he do? What what you know? What, how did you meet? That sort of thing. Um, we met through um, a friend of mine that I lived with at university, and um, she introduced us at a party, and I practically moved in on the first date. Well, how come? Um, because I, it was it was the summer holiday, so I just um, finished my degree. Mm -hmm. And he said, come down for the weekend. And I actually never left. We mm -hmm. went back and got the rest of my stuff. And I ended up living there. And was it kind of legendary love at first sight? Did you lay eyes on him and you just thought... It was for me. I, we, at this party, we were um, walking across the field. And I just felt so comfortable with him. Do you, do you think that he loved you? I think he did. So in that case, <laughs> why this letter, if he loved you? I mean, I'm not saying he didn't. He but... loved me, but love isn't enough, is it? Today I'm kind of At first glance, it's hard to believe that Schopenhauer could really understand the pain that Michelle is going through or have anything helpful to say to anyone in her situation. He never married, lived alone and was often bitterly misogynistic. But go to Frankfurt and take a look around the Schopenhauer archive with archivist and keeper of the Schopenhauer in flame, Joachim Stolberg. There, amongst the rather poignant bits and pieces of Schopenhauer's life, you begin to get a picture of a man who truly deserves the title of philosophy's Dr. Love. Schopenhauer was born in Danzig in 1788, but spent most of his life here in Frankfurt. From an early age, he looked to love for happiness. He was intelligent, confident, good-looking, and after his father died when he was 17, extremely rich. That's him. That's the great man. But success with women eluded him. And his own signature. And that's the earliest. Mm -hmm. That's the earliest photo that we yeah. have of him. Yeah. With with a moustache. I've forgotten the German yeah. for moustache again. What's German for moustache? Schnauzbart. Schnauzbart. So he's got a schnauzbart on. <laughs> and he's a how old? Schnurrbart. Schnurrbart. Yeah. Yeah. And how old is he there? 21. What? 21. And he's he's writing his thesis. Vincesimo at this time. primo. He's writing his thesis. He's he's trying to. He's interested in women. He's trying to meet them, but has problems yeah, yeah, meeting yeah, them. Yeah. Okay. Come back. Was he attractive to women? Um, war er attraktiv für Frauen? Vielleicht, ja. Ein kleiner. Ja, kleiner oh. als wir. Kleiner, ja. Ja, kleiner viel, als wir. Viel kleiner. Viel kleiner. Man sieht es an dem Spazierstock. Aha, okay. Können, wir können ihn herausnehmen. So he, he was quite a small philosopher, which, which ja. meant that anyone with theories of small men. 
Die Handschrift von Caroline Medon. So the, these are the letters from, from Caroline Medon, who was... In 1821, at the age of 33, he did meet a woman who liked him, a 19-year-old singer called Caroline Meudon. But he was never comfortable enough in the relationship to settle down. My lieber Arthur. So she was very warm. She was very warm. She was desperate. She had choice, but she, she fell in love with him. And they had a child together. But she was very keen on marriage. Um, but, but he didn't, he didn't want to. He told her, for two people to get married means to do everything possible to become an object of disgust to one another. Ever warmer letters. After ten stormy years, the relationship broke up. Schopenhauer continued to search for love, but with ever less success. In 1831, he developed a passion for Flora Weiss, a beautiful, spirited girl who had just turned 17. During a boating party, in an attempt to charm her, Schopenhauer started talking to her about his philosophy. He smiled and offered her a bunch of grapes. Flora later confided in her diary, I didn't want them. I felt revolted because old Schopenhauer had touched them, so I let them slide quite gently into the water behind me. Towards the end of his life, he did enjoy a contentment of sorts with an attractive sculptress and admirer of his philosophy, Elizabeth Nye, who came to Frankfurt to make a bust of him. But it was hardly the culmination of the happy romantic life that the young Arthur Schopenhauer had dreamt of. She's quite pretty. Did he like her? Es scheint so, und er hat so intime Dinge geäußert, wie dass er glücklich gewesen sei auf dem Sofa gemeinsam mit der Künstlerin Kaffee zu trinken. They had a very happy time when 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 Elizabeth was making this this portrait of him, sculpture of him. Um, had a lovely time. They sat on the sofa and had coffee together, yeah. and they behaved like a married couple. Yeah. He said. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, did, did he like this portrait of him? Did he, was Schopen he proud Schopenhauer of... had es sehr geliebt, dieses Portrait. He really liked it. Und but his friends seemed to notice that there was a disparity between his head, which is, looks very much the head of a 71-year-old, and the body, which looks like a sort of athletic, wie er 21 wäre, as though he was a 21-year-old yeah. 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 hero. No wonder he liked it. So how could this romantically hapless philosopher have anything wise to tell us about love? Well, for a start, he tells us that love is not a trivial subject. We shouldn't see it as a distraction from more important or grown-up concerns. It's no accident that love is such an overwhelming emotion, that it can take over our lives and fill our every waking moment. And Schopenhauer urges us not to be too hard on ourselves for the obsession and despair it can drive us to when it goes wrong. To be surprised at how much rejection hurts is to ignore just what acceptance would have involved. Nothing in life is more important than love, thought Schopenhauer, because nothing less than the survival of our species is at stake. We all tell ourselves stories about love. We imagine when we fall for someone that we're finding a partner who's going to make us happy. But Schopenhauer saw it very differently. He thought that we put ourselves through the self-conscious phone calls and the expensive candle-lit dinners for one reason only, an overwhelming biological drive to propagate the species. He called it the will to life. Love is a cunning ruse designed by biology to push us towards having children. However romantic we like to think we are, we are all essentially slaves of the will to life. Do you think you've come here to propagate the species? Huh? Do you think you've come here to propagate the species? Every Friday and Saturday night, people flock to nightclubs like this. It wouldn't have been Schopenhauer's kind of place, he hated loud noise, but he would have known exactly why so many of us might want to spend our evenings here. Although it might be deeply uncomfortable for us to accept, although it violates our rational self-image, and although it's deeply un-PC to say so, we are all driven here by a blind biological urge to reproduce. 
Tell me why you've come here tonight, honestly. Uh, for a cheesy night out and just have some filthy birds. Right. Do you think you've come here to propagate the species? <laughs> I don't really feel like propagating the species at this moment. It's kind of my life. Right. So it's completely unconnected to that, you think? You haven't come here to, to do that? Myself personally, no, I haven't. No. Good. I think what was key for Schopenhauer is that the will to life can operate, but in a rather unconscious way, so that people are consciously driven to come to a, a, a club like this to have a drink and to have a laugh with friends but unconsciously uh, driven by a, a need to reproduce the next generation when confronted with the question are you doing this they'll of course reject it but Schopenhauer didn't think that that meant that it wasn't actually driving them uh, it was but in order for the will to life to be effective it has to remain unconscious because no one would consciously take on the burden of reproducing the next generation What's going on in there that makes you want to, to hang out here? This is really black and we just got like quite a few shag. They're looking for a shag? Really? Can I ask you why you've come here tonight? You want the honest answer? Yeah. To pull a bird. To pull a bird. You might well object that the last thing on your mind when you ask someone for their phone number in a bar is having a baby. But Schopenhauer insisted that this was precisely what was motivating us unconsciously. The very moment when two young people fancy one another should be considered as the birth of a new individual, he wrote. His theory explains the intensity with which we feel drawn to the people we fancy. But why do we fancy certain individuals and not others? One of the profoundest mysteries of love is why him or why her? Why do we fall in love with the people we do? Huge numbers of people leave us cold, even though they may on paper be perfect for us. And just as strangely, we find ourselves falling in love with other people who might be quite tricky to live with. Schopenhauer had an answer. Whenever we fall in love with someone, we do so because we unconsciously sense that they'll help us to make healthy, well-balanced children. Love is nothing more than our will to life discovering someone who it thinks will make an ideal co-parent. This led Schopenhauer to some interesting thoughts about the rules of attraction. We're driven to fall in love with people who will cancel out any imperfections we may have, and so ensure that our children are proportioned in limb and stable of mind. Very tall people will tend to be drawn to short people so that their children won't turn out to be giants. And people with big chins will be attracted to people with small chins so that their children's chins will be ideal. He even believed that this search for balance extended to skin color and that the natural human color was brown. Some of Schopenhauer's ideas might seem a bit fanciful now. One wouldn't necessarily put him in charge of a dating agency and there are all sorts of emotional and sexual relationships which he leaves out. But a generation before Darwin and some 60 years before Freud, he was the first to point out that there are largely unconscious biological reasons why we fall in love. The lover who saves our child from having an enormous chin or from being excessively shy is seldom a person to make us happy for a lifetime. The pursuit of happiness and the production of children are two radically different projects which love maliciously confuses us into thinking of as one for as long as it takes to spawn and bring up the kids. Only much later, as our healthy, well-balanced offspring are kicking a ball around the garden, will we realize that we've been fooled? We'll divorce or pass family dinners in hostile silence. Schopenhauer offered us a stark choice. It seems as if in making a marriage, either the individual or the interest of the species must come off badly. And he left no doubt that he thought it would be the individual who would suffer most.
unhappy in love, his work almost universally ignored, Schopenhauer withdrew into a modest bachelor apartment in a street in Frankfurt called Schöner Aussicht, an ironic name given the bleakness of his views, as it means beautiful outlook in German. In an otherwise quite miserable life, one of his joys was the music. Before we had lunch, he normally played about an hour of Rossini and on something like that. Can you play? Can you spielen? Nein, ich kann nicht. Gar nicht. Und ich, ich Und glaube, sie sind auch jetzt nicht bespielbar. Weil you can't, you couldn't play them anymore. Solche Instrumente müssen immer gespielt werden. Mm. Still, I mean, the, these are his marks of his mouth. Yeah. He grew almost comically pessimistic advising his few readers to swallow a toad every morning to ensure that they wouldn't meet with anything more disgusting in the day ahead. The instruments, we're, not going to, we're not going to play Rossini here, sadly. Human existence, he wrote, must be a kind of error. It may be said of it, it's bad today, and every day it will get worse until the worst of all happens. It's safe, it's safe trusting fear than faith. It's safer trusting fear than faith. A typically gloomy Schopenhauerian comment. Schopenhauer's closest relationships were now with a succession of poodles. He lavished affection on them. He even called one of them Atma, after the world soul of the Brahmins. And he took a keen interest in animal welfare. Towards the very end of his life, his ideas did finally begin to find an audience. And his last book, a somber collection of philosophical essays and aphorisms, became an unlikely bestseller. Philosophically minded Frankfurters began to buy poodles in homage to him. So the, the brain is the center of attention. Rather unusually, the light falls on, on his head. It's the most important part ja. of the philosopher. Not, ja. not necessarily his eyes or his mouth, but his. Und den Spiegel his brain. der Seele, die Augen. He looks very intelligent. Uh, in the height of his fame, he said that the Nile had at last reached Cairo. That's how he described his fame. But he had little time to enjoy the attention and develop more cheerful thoughts. In 1860, after a walk by the banks of the river Mine with his beloved poodle, Schopenhauer returned home, complained of breathlessness, and died. If a god made this world, he said, then I would not like to be the god its misery and distress would break my heart. It might seem odd to say that Schopenhauer could have anything helpful to tell us about love, given that he was such a misery himself. But I think he has some very consoling things to say. Firstly, he tells us that we simply have no choice but to fall in love. Biology is stronger than reason, and so we're not unhappy by accident. In essence, we're just like all other creatures in the zoo. We're impelled to find a mate, to spawn offspring and to bring them up, and only a force as strong as love could get us to do so. Schopenhauer took a particular interest in very ugly creatures, creatures like moles and aardvarks, and these wild dwarf mongoose. What interested him was the way that these creatures' lives are often extremely hard. They have to survive very harsh winters, they have to live in uh, horrible little underground caves, and they have children that look rather like gelatinous worms. And yet that doesn't stop them trying very, very hard to reproduce. In fact, we see a couple of these uh, wild monkeys having a go at reproduction over there. And uh, he thought that we should take a lesson from our own behavior from these creatures, which is that we're devoted to reproduction without necessarily thinking about happiness, or rather we think we're doing this for happiness, but rather like mongoose, we're doing so because we have to, because of the will to life. So if reproduction makes us sad, if we don't feel that our marriages have gone well, we should draw a lesson from these creatures here in the cave. And they're doing it not for happiness, but because they have to, because of the will to life. Schopenhauer has another message about love, which I think is particularly helpful for us when we've been rejected. We often can't understand why our partner has ended a relationship and take it extremely personally. But Schopenhauer tells us that when someone dumps us, it's not us that they're rejecting. It's not that we're unlovable. It's just that their will to life thinks that they'll be able to produce more balanced, healthier children with someone else. And someone else will come along whose will to life thinks we'd be ideal for that purpose. 
even if only because our nose and their nose will make a desirable combination. We might have been happy with the person who rejected us, but nature wasn't, and for that reason, we have to learn to let them go. Do you think you'll go out with a different kind of man next? Not necessarily. You haven't been out with anyone since? No. Or? Does the thought even, like, it's just horrific? The thought just makes me panic, the thought of risking yeah, everything all over again, and I gave so much into that relationship that I, I can't imagine. Was it the most important thing in your life? Hmm, definitely was. Yeah, I would have given up everything for that, for that person. Mm. What, what, everything? What, you would have moved country? I would have moved would... country, I'd have left my job and I absolutely love my job. I would have done anything. Anything more or less that he told you that yeah. was right for the relationship? Mm. Huge sacrifice. Mm. I think w one nice thing is if someone knows you and then they reject you, you tend to think well, they've known my personality. They know you inside out. They know me they, inside out. And a... they've said no. Yeah. Which is horrible. I mean, it's... they haven't, haven't just taken a casual glance, they've taken a deep glance and they said no. And I think what Schopenhauer says is, in a way, they have only taken a casual glance because really what they're looking at is not your psychological self, but as mm. it were, your biological self. Uh, that in a sense, the end of most relationships occur in the conscious mind as, I no longer fancy this person. And what that really means is, they're not really right for me, for children. You know, at that level, it is very animal, and so we mustn't interpret it consciously, um, and that's we mustn't take it sad, personally. I can't have the person I want. Isn't that sad? It is sad. It is sad. Isn't that tragic? No, it is tragic. It is hmm. tragic. But maybe in a way there's there's a certain consolation in becoming aware of the tragic forces of nature that in a way, hmm. you know, and seeing uh, sort of rising, you know, rather like being in an aeroplane looking down on the world and thinking, hmm. well, you know, this is the crazy world we live in. <laughs> The traditional view is that this couple will live happily ever after. The cynical, modern view is that they're doomed to recrimination and a quick divorce. Schopenhauer asks us to consider a different view, that happiness is simply not the point, any more than it is for porcupines or mongoose. He didn't mean to depress us, rather to free us from the kinds of expectations which can inspire bitterness. It's consoling when love has made us sad, to hear that happiness was never really part of the plan. The darkest thinkers can sometimes, paradoxically, be the most cheering. I have one last question, which my will to life is asking me to ask you, which is, are, are you free for dinner tonight? <laughs> Would you be free for dinner tonight? I'd be 